Right. Good morning, everyone. Oh, welcome to the session. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our teaching. Uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this time. Once again, you've given us to study and learn your word of God. We pray that you will continue to minister, and even as we learn the deep truths of your word, of our identity in you, pray, God, that we will truly live out this identity in our lives, oh God. We thank you. Be with us through this session, Lord. Uh, Holy Spirit, minister to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Right, I hope my audio is fine. Uh, if it is not, just let me know. Okay, so thank you. All right, so we last class we did quite a few topics. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, good morning. Uh, so we did uh, chapter 38 through, uh, through we talk, talked about being, being sanctified. We were sanctified once, we are being sanctified. Uh, every day of our life, right? We talked about that uh, when we believe in Jesus, we become the sanctification of God. Uh, but over time, every day, we are being sanctified, right? Uh, so it is a daily process. It is not a one-time event. Then we looked at two important or prominent ways that you and I as believers are sanctified. One is by the Word of God, and two is the working of His Holy Spirit, right? Uh, so, of course, we renew our thinking, we renew our mind uh, through the Word of God. That the Word of God is able to change our lives, help us to walk in obedience to the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit is there to help us. Right uh, Now, whenever we try to do something on our own, we may not be able to do it. We may not be able to overcome certain things that are happening in our life. But the Holy Spirit is there to help us overcome. And, and the Holy Spirit enables us to walk in this sanctification, to walk in holiness. Right, so let's get into chapter 41. Now that we are sanctified, uh, let me just uh, present the notes uh, so that we can all be together. Okay. So chapter 41, living sanctified in Christ. Right, so. So how, do, how does this identity of being sanctified, right? Uh, how does it affect our life, right? Uh, how, does, how, does, how is it for you and I as believers, what must change? Or what are the things that we must do in living the sanctified life? Right. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, 1 through 7. Yes, would anyone like to read? First Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 through 7. Pastor, can I read? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Good. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 to 7. I finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no man should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified for god did not call us to uncleanliness but in holiness yes sorry i uh, thank you uh, gertrude i just need to stop the presentation for a moment let's do it again Okay, so Paul is writing here to the Thessalonians. He's saying, since you are sanctified, we must learn to possess our vessel, meaning we must learn to live in holiness. We must also hold one another in honor. We must. We need to stay away from things that can defile us. Right. So it says here, uh, stay away from things that violates us. Right. So 
how how can we do this? How can you and I as believers do this? It is through the word of God, right? So we 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 tell ourselves, okay, God, I don't want to do things that will, you know, defile my myself. I know that I'm a child of God. This is my identity, and I'm the sanctification of God. We need to stay away. If there are things in in our life uh, or areas in our life where we feel that okay uh, this is a weakness we need to ask god to help us and to try and stay away from it right so let's look at a few points how we can continue to walk in holiness uh well, we walk in love to walk in holiness right uh, first thessalonians 3 12 and 13 and the lord and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. Here's the interesting part. We cannot walk in holiness if we don't walk in love. Right? The more we walk in holiness, the more we will be able to love one another. And this is also vice versa. Meaning, the more we walk in love, the more we love God, the more we will want to walk in holiness. We will not want to be disobedient to God. Right? So they both are two, two sides of a coin. We walk in love, we will, be, we will also walk in holiness. Now, the love that we're talking about here, where Paul is writing, is not the, it's not the love that we, uh, you know, it's the agape love. It's the God kind of love that, uh, Paul is talking about here, right? Uh, and so when we walk in love, we will walk in holiness, right? So another way to continue to walk this sanctified life is to have sanctified standards and values. Now, each one of us as believers, we, and not only believers, but if you look around, all of us, right, as human beings, we have certain standards, we have certain values, right? Now, this is, this has come over time. If you look at a five-year-old boy, they may not have any standards. They don't have any values. They're too small. They don't understand. But the moment this little boy becomes a teen, he begins to understand values. He begins to understand that I need to have certain standards. Now, the standards could be good or bad. The values could be good or bad. But they begin to understand there is something called a standard. There are values in life. Now, as the child or the teen becomes a youth, those standards and those values keep changing. And then once they grow up, they come, become they probably get married, have children. All of these, all of us have certain standards and values. Now, Paul is writing to the Romans here, and he's saying, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable, reasonable service. And this is this is a you know a standard which he's placing. And look what he what he says after that. Do not be conformed to this world. Again, a standard. Don't don't do what the world is doing. You have your own standards. You have your own values. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and the acceptable will for will of God. Now, as we live in a manner that is pleasing to God, it is important that we transform our lifestyle. So what is lifestyle? Lifestyle is our, our standards, our values, our morals. You can have good standards. We can have holy standards, unholy standards. So for example, uh, there could be somebody who, you know, a person, a believer, uh, can can be somebody who has a certain, you know, standard of saying, okay, wherever I go in, in, in the workplace, in the corporate place, wherever I go, I will make sure that I will not use bad words. I'm just giving an example. Right? I will not use bad words. Now, that's a standard. It's a value he's set in place. So wherever he is, whether he's at home, whether he's in the workplace, whether he's with his friends, 
everyone else may be using bad words. But for he, this person, hey, I'm not going to use bad words because it's a certain standard that I've maintained. These are certain values that I've hold on to. Right. Now, on the other side, you can have somebody who has no standards or no values. Right? They can be whatever they want to be. They can say whatever they want to say, and nothing affects them. Right? Now, remember, Paul is saying, Paul is writing here, Romans 12, 2, especially. Do not be conformed to this world and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When we renew our mind, we may be able to do what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. You know, I've heard this saying, right? They say that India is a safe place or not a safe place. Iran, Iraq may not be safe places, right? Uh, China may not be a safe place or different countries have different you know, standards and people think, okay, this is a safe place and that is not a safe place. But I, I read this article once and it said that the safest place to be is to be, is to be in the will of God. That is the safest place we can be. Right? Because life is uncertain, our future is uncertain. But the safest place, it's not a country, it's not a, uh, a, a locality in a country, but the safest place you and I can be is to be in the will of God. Now, how do I know I'm in the will of God? As a child of God, you're continuing daily to transform yourself by the renewing of your mind, trying our best, working our best to live a holy life, right? Obeying God's word. When we do these things, we are in the will of God. And that's the safest place that we can be in. Now, when I say safest place, doesn't mean nothing, no harm is going to come. Doesn't mean that life is going to be very easy and simple. What did Jesus say? I've come to do the will of the Father. What is the will of the Father? He had to be crucified. He had to die on the cross, but it brought joy to the to the Lord Jesus. So, as believers, always remember this: right? the safest place we can be is to be in the will of God. The moment we tell ourselves, "Hey, I'm not going to do what the world is doing. I want to live a holy life. I want to be obedient to God's word," you're in the will of God. Another way we continue to live out our sanctification is. A sanctified life reveals his virtues, right? When you say virtues, uh, virtues are basically our attributes right? or, or uh, our character, right? So a kingly priesthood, the, the Lord Jesus has chosen us as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, uh, a chosen nation, a holy people to himself, right? And to, we are to proclaim these virtues to people. Right? Yeah. So, so for example, how can I say I'm a chosen generation? Or how can I be a, 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 a kingly priesthood? How can people know that I am a believer by our virtues? The beauty of God, the holiness of God, is revealed by our virtues. When we, when we, the way we are, the way we portray ourselves, the way we look at others, the way we talk, it is all the virtues of, of, of the Lord Jesus. It begins to, people will notice it. So imagine the Lord Jesus, you know, saying, wherever Jesus went, he spoke in love, he spoke, uh, he, he, he healed, he, he, he brought life in dead situations. You and I as holy ones, as sanctified ones, are to reveal his virtues, his life, his character must be revealed in us. And interestingly, or the, the most encouraging part for us is we don't have to do it on our own strength. God has given us the Holy Spirit to do that. And next one, we are sanctified vessels in Christ. Now, uh, look at this. Paul is writing to Timothy here. And this is his last letter, 2 Timothy. And 
he's writing something very important. Second Timothy 2, 19 through 20. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Let everyone whose names the name of Christ, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some of honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself with the latter, meaning cleanses himself with the gold and silver, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Right. So Paul is, uh, you know, just bringing the example out for the uh, for the church in Ephesus. Right. So Paul is uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, and Timothy is the pastor in Ephesus. Now in Ephesus, we know that there was a lot of idol worship and you know during those days during you know, when there was idol worship they would usually take these vessels right and they would pour out their offerings on these idols right so these vessels are very important and, and we see some of it in the old old testament as well but these vessels would uh, they would either be of uh, you know uh, whatever during those times uh, but they were vessels. They would they would pour it out on those idols. It was a, so these vessels were a, like an honorable thing for the idol for the idol worshippers. So Paul is writing here and he's saying, "You and I are to be vessels of honor, vessels of gold and silver." Right now, what is the thing with a vessel? Just uh, I and I read this little article, quite a few years back, many years back. And this article was about, it's just an allegory, right? It's its a made up story. It's an allegory. It, it's not a real story, but uh, it portrays a, a thought or an idea. So Jesus is walking through a house. And in that house, there were beautiful pots, right? some of gold and silver and precious stones and emeralds and Jesus is walking and the gold vessel is saying, oh, Jesus, you take me. Look at me. I look so beautiful. Then the silver is saying, look at me. I also look so beautiful. And the emerald and the jasper and all these vessels are saying, you know, Lord Jesus, you should choose me. You know, you, I'll be so beautiful for your kingdom. But Jesus kept walking without saying a word. And right at the back, there was a broken mud pot almost all cracked up and very bad condition and so jesus takes and the, and the broken mud pot was thinking to himself now i'm useless i uh i, I cannot be used for anything because i'm broken uh, uh, i'm just a mud pot look at the others they're gold silver and precious stones and all of it i'm a mud pot i'm of no use at all but jesus takes that broken mud pot and says all of those other pots are ready to be used. But this pot, I can make it the way I want. I can turn this mud pot into something beautiful. And it's such an important lesson for us. You know, we may have brokenness in our life. We may have areas where we are not as strong as we ought to be. We may have, you know, things in our life that is uh, you know, making us feel unworthy. The Lord Jesus says, I will make you a vessel of honor. All we need to do is surrender that brokenness. Surrender it to God and say, God, this is what I am. This is my brokenness. And the Lord Jesus will turn us into a vessel of honor, prepared for every good work useful for the master right so don't let your brokenness or your your uh, you know sometimes it's, it was just a mud pot There's nothing fancy about it right but jesus is not looking for that he's looking for people who are broken but people who are willing and obedient and he uses us as his vessels right? now another important point to remember is as sanctified people we 
are persecuted and ridiculed. People hate us. Like John chapter 17, I'll just read a few portions. Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the Lord. I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your truth is your word. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So Jesus is talking to the Father about his disciples. And for their sake, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Second Timothy 3.12 Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So, as believers, if we are living a holy life, nobody is going to put a red carpet and clap for you. Right? Nobody is going to do that. Nobody is going to say, oh, you're a great man of God. No. There's going to be persecution. Now, I, I'm talking about outside, right? When you're outside of the church, the body of Christ, there's going to be persecution. Right? Nobody's going to say, oh, you're very good. You're talking about Jesus. No. There's going to be persecution. Right? If you look at what's happening in, in our nation itself, in the north of India, so much of persecution. And it is only a small percentage of persecution that's going to come ahead. And there's so much more that's going to come. But remember this. If we live a godly life, if we are living in holiness, now persecution need not always be, you know, the thought that we have is some, you know, some people coming, breaking the chairs, beating us, putting us in prison. No. It can also be in, uh, in the office. In your workplace, say, hey, this person is always talking about Jesus. That's also a persecution because you're bearing the name of Jesus. Now, people may ridicule you, people may mock at you. You know, you're believing somebody who died so many years back that you've not even seen him. It's foolishness what you're doing. The whole, everyone are enjoying, everyone are living their life, drinking, and uh, living, enjoying, just enjoying life. And you are here always with the Bible saying this is what Jesus said, that is what Jesus said. People will ridicule. But that's how it is. As sanctified children of God, you will suffer persecution. But the world will not understand. Remember, we just read that verse in the book of John. Jesus is sending out his disciples saying, they are not when they go out and preach, some of them will reject the word because they are not of the world. They are not of God. They are living in the world. They don't understand the things of God. Right? So, when, when we are living this life, don't worry about what people are thinking about you. What will he think? What will she think? What will he think if I say, uh, I'm going to church on Sunday? What will she think if I'm going to... Uh, you know, cell group on Thursday. Uh, what will she think if I'm going for worship practice? What will he think? No, don't worry about what people think. Worry about what God thinks about you. God is saying, hey, you are holy, you are sanctified and set you apart. Right? Then we are sanctified and preserved blameless. First Thessalonians 5.23 Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Right? And we talked about these three aspects, right? Spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is who you are. The soul is your emotions, uh, uh, your, your mind, will, and emotions, and your body. That is your outer, your, your body, your physical body. And so it says there, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. Interesting, right? Paul is not saying, okay, anyway, the body is going to, you know, become ashes. So you do what you want with your body, but make sure your spirit and soul is right before God. No. Right? It, it doesn't work that way. Being tripod, we must understand that what we do with our flesh is also important. 
because God made this. Right? The Lord Jesus himself had to die in the flesh. Right? Jesus didn't come and uh, stay for, you know, he could he could have done, you know, he could have just come and said, okay, next week I'm getting crucified and you believe in me and all of them will have everlasting life. One week on earth. I go through the whole process. No. He had he did it to set the example for us. He overcame temptations to set the example for us. He had a body just like you and me. Just like you and me. And he, we, he had to go through those physical weaknesses as well. Right? Jesus, imagine Jesus fasting 40 days. Do you think he was full of strength physically? No, oh, he would have been very weak. And the, he and the disciples were on the boat. Jesus was sleeping. Why? He was tired, physically tired, walking. So remember that this spirit, soul, and body, all three are important. And we keep them holy and blameless till the coming of our Lord. So, you, so what can we do? We tell our spirit, Holy Spirit, help me to be in line, let my spirit, you, we tune our spirit to be in line with the Holy Spirit. We tell our soul, that is our mind, our will, our emotions. So the mind, devil is attacking our mind. We say, we tell our mind, no, I'm not going to listen to this. There's the will comes into place. We tell your will, God, help me to obey. I want to overcome this. Then there's emotions. Sometimes we feel like giving up. We tell, no, God, I know you're with me. I know. That you are, you will strengthen me. So, our body, we have weaknesses, right? There are urges in our bodies. We tell our body, no, I tune it, I tune my body to the things of God, right? Uh, and so that way, we are preserving ourselves blameless before God, right? So these are some of the ways that we continue to walk in holiness. Right? So, oh. Uh, there are some common questions uh, that have arised. Uh, attire, contemporary preachers' attire. Now, sometimes, you know, when we look at the, the new pastors and the contemporary churches, the new churches that are there, you know, you have these pastors wearing jackets and chain with a cross and all of it. Uh, now, people have questions. Is it okay to do that? Right? Because if you look at uh, in a nation like India, you look, it's always very, it has always been, you know, formals. Uh, but listen, we need to understand that it's things have changed, things have evolved, right? Uh, uh, you can't expect people to be the same how they were. Right? Uh, so even if they're wearing a sweatshirt and they, you know, they're wearing a chain, doesn't mean that they're not holy. Right? Uh, but it's good for a preacher to dress up appropriately because they're being an example right okay careers entertainment fashion design right now this is another you know as believers you're in the entertainment business or fashion uh, design right we can work there there's nothing wrong working in these places but set priorities set standards set certain values right now in the entertainment business there's there's there could be bribe there could be a lot of parties right uh, uh, drugs alcohol uh, all of this will be easily available right uh, so you you must have certain values you must say no to certain things so again we must uh, be willing to overcome that right now for example you're working in the entertainment section uh, and you know i think every week there will be a party there's all kinds of things happening in those parties now you have the choice. If it's possible, you can request that you be uh, exempted from attending those events. But if you are part of, you have to be part of it. You can go, but you don't have. You have certain value. You can tell yourself, no, no matter what people say, I am not going to do what everyone else are doing here. Right? Then you have church stage decor. People have a lot of questions about this. Is it right? Is it holy to have this kind of a stage decor? There's nothing wrong, right? 
but make sure that the decor is not you know it doesn't portray anything that is uh, you know evil or portray something that is not right it should be something that is uh, nothing wrong in having good stage decor nothing wrong about it then questions about drinking alcohol now if i drink alcohol is it okay no it's not okay because jesus said you are the temple of the holy spirit what about food offered to idols no it's not okay because paul says to the corinthians he says if how can you partake in the lord's table and also partake on food with food sacrificed to idols right can you be part can you partake in the lord's table and also the devil's table together so he's talking about that in corinthians so um so he talks a lot in detail about that. Right? So uh, you learn more in the book, the Epistle of Corinthians as well. So, uh, so there will be times when people will, you know, that is sacrificed to idols. They, they come and offer it very politely. We can say, no, thank you. Nothing wrong. And I have done done it many times. They have festivals. They have programs. When I was in the corporate sector, working in the corporate office, they have. And so. They would come and say, "Hey, why don't you have some?" I would say, "No." I would say, "Oh, why Jesus? Was, Jesus won't get angry." So I don't care. I don't care what you think about it. But for me, my God is more important. So I would say to them, "No, thank you." It doesn't matter what they speak about me. It doesn't matter. I'm keeping. I'm preserving my body, my spirit, my soul for God. Right. Okay, so some of the other points, jewelry, nothing wrong, please wear jewelry. If, there's nothing wrong, right? You have to wear it. Movies, now again, movies is is a constant topic where people have a lot of questions. Right? Will I become unholy if I watch a movie? Will the devil come and sit in my house? Right, now, what kind of movie? Right. Uh, if you're look, watching a movie and you know this movie has sexual content, right? Now, remember this what we see affects our mind, right? If I keep seeing things, you know, my, my teacher used to say this it's called Gigo, G I G O, garbage in, garbage out. If you keep watching garbage, garbage will come. Perfume won't come out. Right. If you keep thinking of the word of God, keep thinking about God, all things of God will come. Out. So when it comes to movies, now I wouldn't say that if you watch a movie, you you know you go to hell. That's not it. Right? Uh, but make sure that as a believer, okay, there are certain things that you can watch. Certain things you can just avoid. Right. Now, personally, for me, uh, I'm not interested in movies. Not very interested from small never been really interested but i know people who are really interested in movies they they love to watch movies um yeah but you just got to be careful what we are seeing again music secular music okay so a lot of people have asked me this question right i like to listen to a lot of songs and these songs are not gospel songs they're not bad songs right they don't have bad words they don't have bad meaning uh but they're secular songs. Right? What do I do about it? Now, here's the thing. Does it, uh, this is the question I always ask people. What does it do to you when you listen to a secular music? What does it do to you? Okay, it brings you some happiness. Okay, but what benefit has it done? Is it helped you in any way? See, I'm not saying don't listen to secular music. If you want to listen to, you listen to it. Uh, but for me, I don't. It just doesn't interest me. Uh, uh, it's just that, is it helpful for me? Is it going to make me a more close? Is it going to make me grow closer to Christ? Now, when I was not a believer, I listened only to secular music. Even as I became, when I became a believer, I would still listen to secular music, but it took time for me to come out of it. Okay? And now we've got contemporary church music. A lot of questions about that. 
that oh is this song right is you know uh, some songs are theologically theologically they're wrong or they don't sound right or the contemporary church music has a lot of you know keyboard sound a lot of you know synthesizers and all these pads and lightings and all of it is it okay right so a lot of questions about all of this but the question that we must ask ourselves are you growing closer to God through all of this? Are you growing closer to God? Right? Again, participation in religious festivals, right? Uh, when there are religious festivals, should I participate? Are, are there some guidelines that I should have? See, if you're in a corporate sector and you have to be part of a religious festival, I, I remember this few of them from our church. They, you know, we, they came up to me and said, you know, my family are not saved; they're unsaved, and so they have these yearly, you know, festivals that uh, they have to follow, and so they have to be part of it because their entire family is coming. Now, these, uh, you know, the children are believers; parents are unbelievers. So they go, and the question they ask me is, "What should I do?" And they say, you know, as the eldest son, you have to do this certain ritual. So what should I do? You know, so some of, there was this young two brothers who were, you know, who were from a Hindu faith, and uh, they had to go and you know, be part of these festivals in their hometown. But I remember the elder one coming and saying, "My parents told me to do this, but I declined doing it. And I know they may have felt bad. I know they may have felt hurt. Uh, I love my parents." But I have to obey God as well, and and to see that kind of maturity, uh, it's not easy. It's not pain. It's not something very easily somebody can do. Uh, but the level of maturity that they walked in, you know, knowing that hey, God is priority out of all these things. Right. So, uh, what about science and genetics? Now we have all kinds of people coming up with all kinds of. Uh, you no know, male, female, uh, transgender, binary, all these things coming up, and then they say genetics. Uh, genetically, I'm born like this. Now we must be able to give good response to all of these things. Now, even as uh, again tattoos as well. Is it okay to tattoo your body? Uh, uh, will will you become unholy if you tattoo your body? Now, remember again the same concept. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? Why, why would I want to? Now, just because I write Jesus Christ on my hand doesn't mean Jesus Christ is coming and sitting on the tattoo. It's about the life that we live. I can have Jesus and uh, all the 12 disciples on my tattooed on my body. Doesn't make a difference. It's not like the devil will say, Jesus Christ is tattooed on his body, so I will not come. No. You can put 100 crosses on your body and a tattoo. It's not going to help. Because the sanctification, our life, is what is going to matter. Right? But is it is it something that is going to? The answer is: Is it something that is going to sanctify me to be closer with God? Right? That's the question we must ask ourselves. Okay, uh, I think we'll stop here uh, because I wanted to start with section five. Uh, we'll start with. Uh, from next class so that we can spend more time but what i like you to do is um, if you have questions you can uh, write it down sanjay n says most music and movies and social media today are of full of sublime little programming which leads us yes very true very true thank you sanjay for sharing um, a lot of you know I, I grew up in the early 90s, right? So a lot of music was there, corporate music. It was okay, right? Uh, we were talking about all of these other things, about the world and whatever. But now it's different. Because every kind of music is somewhere turning us away from God. Uh, uh, it'll either say, you know, there are some songs right now that we see around us. They're uh, talking about secular songs uh, where they are openly mocking Jesus. Uh, openly, they are probably saying, you know, Satan is better. Satanists. 
all of these things uh, so uh, so be careful what you watch now even here's another interesting thing uh, so one of my one of the parents in our church was talking to us they're saying even cartoons which children watch are programmed towards you know uh, either they are you know, there was this recently one of the family one of our family members at church was saying you know uh, my children have been watching this series where it talks about nature and about different gods on the earth and so each god has certain power and what should this god do and, and this is seven six years old seven year old children uh, that have this question okay we have two questions here Dell says can a servant of God be an artist or an actor? Yes, yes, definitely they can be. Uh, if if that's one of their gifts and talents, yes, nothing wrong, right? Uh, uh, so there are many who profess to be believers. Uh, no, no. If you're saying a servant of God, meaning like a pastor or a preacher, yes. If if that's something that he is, wants to do. But make sure that it's not, uh, uh, you know, it's not a, right, it's not something that will, the movie or the, uh, you know, the series, whatever they do, it doesn't take them away from God. But it, it is not defiling the person. Deeksha says, Pastor, if someone is in Christ, but they listen and watch secular movie and song and say nothing is wrong with this, then what should we say? Okay, this... See, here's the thing. When we when we talk to people, sometimes you know, and they could be believers, unbelievers. When we say they may not be in a place to receive correction, right? Now there could be many reasons because they need time. One, two is you know they may say, "Hey, how come you are telling me?" And they may feel that way. Now. If somebody is listening to secular movies and listening to secular songs, always remember this, right? the truth, remember what Jesus said? You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The more you tell somebody, don't do this, it is natural that they'll want to do it. But the more you tell somebody, this is what Jesus says, this is what Jesus can do in your life. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Bible teaches us. So we're not telling people what not to do, but we're telling people what to do. And there's power in that. Like for me, uh, when I became, uh, before I was a believer, everyone would say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. I would get really upset. Say, Why? Why are you all telling me don't do everything? But as, once I became a believer, when people started telling me, I, I realized, okay, yes, I have to change these areas. But then there was, I, I thank God for people who told me what to do rather than what not to do. So as I mentioned, after I became a believer, I was still listening to secular songs because I've been listening to them for like 10, 15 years. But by people telling me what to do, hey, why don't you spend more time in reading the word or praying? So when I spent time doing more of this, listening to secular songs took the second place. And slowly it went away. So the best thing to do is, uh, Diksha, is to tell people what to do. I know it's very upsetting sometimes. I get very upset. See, I told him, don't listen to this corporate, or don't listen to secular songs. He's listening. We get angry. We get upset. But it's not going to solve the problem. What you can do is focus on what Jesus can do in his life. All the other things would go. You know, well, when I before becoming a believer, I used to wear a lot of chains and you know these bangles, these a lot of rings and all that. Uh, right. And uh, after I became a believer, I still had it on stick chain. And, and people used to say, "Hey, you have to take it off." I didn't take it off. But the more I spent time on God, now I'm not saying it's wrong. Okay, but the more I spent time in God's presence and looking at what God says, all of these other things took second place. What's the point of this chain? It's just heavy, poking me. Look at it and threw it away. So you see the mind changes. Everything changes. 
the way we look at things changes. So Deeksha, what I would say is you, you tell people what to do. Eventually, those other things will automatically go away. Gertrude says, how do you preach to the same gender persons getting married? Uh, yeah, you tell them the truth. The truth is the truth. That is, God made Adam and Eve, man and woman. Uh, and that's God's design. Anything in the book of Romans, right? In Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, uh, this is the problem that was happening. People were, uh, uh, you know, of same gender were getting married. And what was worse in Rome was brothers and sisters were getting married. Sons, you know, and their own mother were getting married. Could be stepmother as well. So it was complete abomination. Right? So what you can say to them is, now, if, if they're way beyond understanding, right, something that you can do is you can just tell them about God's design. You can tell them that, see, this is what God has said. Uh, and it's very unlikely that initially they will believe it. But uh, these are uh, strongholds. And these strongholds need to be prayed over and need to be broken. But to encourage us, Gertrude, remember that across the world, people who are gay and lesbian have come out and uh, they've become believers. And, you know, many of them have got married, living happy lives. So the thing, first thing that we can say is we can tell them it's a sin. We know that you may have these desires, but these desires are out of their own flesh. It is not something that we are born with, not at all. It is desires of our own flesh. Uh, so we can tell them that this is wrong in God's eyes. Again, we cannot force people to believe we cannot force them to uh, you know to say hey you have to uh, you have to listen to me their response may be different but we are doing our part by saying this that they, nowadays when you tell these children they think it is normal you know yeah. but it's not normal we know yes so the thing is here Gertrude is we must understand that this generation is uh, it, it's changing right so for example you talk about uh, Cassette tape. Yeah. Yeah. For us, it's normal. I have so many cassettes that we used to listen to. Now, you ask our children, they don't even know what a cassette is. So, uh, growing up in the 90s, we we had this concept of you know media and this concept of internet and mobile phones was not even there. So, as the generations keep going, right, all of these things will, they, there'll come a time when even in India, People will, uh, it'll be so open. Right now, it's you know, it's not a topic that many people talk about very openly. Uh, but maybe uh, five years, ten years, one decade down the line, I mean, marriage is happening in the church. This is yeah. a way that the enemy is working. So, uh, yeah. So we need to again speak the truth of God's word. Let them be ministered through that. Okay, Thank John. You, welcome, Gertrude. John is saying uh, many pastors say the music came from heaven. It started in heaven. There is nothing wrong to listen to other songs. Is it correct? Okay, music started in heaven, but even pride started in heaven. So it's okay to walk in pride. Definitely not. And Lucifer. Oh, what, 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 what happened to Lucifer? Right. right. So, so that's what. When it's very important. Next semester, you learn hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is taking scripture and putting it into context. So, taking text, putting it into context. So, when pastors say that music came from heaven, music is God. God created music. Right. So. When God created something, it is always good. Music is good, but what the enemy has done, he has defiled that music. See, when God, that's a huge topic. When God sent Lucifer, was condemned, he, was, he went down. God didn't take away his gifts. God didn't say, okay, now give back the gift of music, the, all the gifts that I gave you, give it back. No, God didn't say that. Just condemned him. So, like all other things that the devil does, he has used music. And he's used music to 
come up with all kinds of things, taking people away. You know, when you get into rock and roll, and, oh, heavy, all these other music, rock music and all of it, it is always associated with sex and drugs. Oh, sorry, Lucy, did I miss your question? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'll just finish this and come to you, Lucy. Right? Sorry, I didn't notice that. Oh, question. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, brother. Thank you. Yeah. So, so there is. It's so when pastors say that their understanding is wrong, right? Uh, it it is wrong to say that. Uh, remember that listening to to these, like what I said, when we listen to things that are happening, uh, uh, songs that are talking about, you know. Uh, which could really talk about Antichrist or about things against Jesus, killing each other, all of this. What's happening? It's not from heaven. Now, of course, it's wrong to listen to them because it's going into our mind, it's going into our spirit. Us, you know, music transcends our physical thing, right? It, it's, it, music doesn't give us physical happiness, it, it goes into our spirit, our soul. And, you know, when we have supernatural love and we're, when we are singing, well, what is happening? It goes into our spirit, to our soul. OK, is it OK I take just five minutes more? Uh, quite a few questions here. But those who'd like to uh, have other things to do, feel free to. OK, let me look at Lucy. Is studying about psychology good? I've heard people saying it's not good uh, reading in minds of people. Lucy, uh, psychology is very important. It's, this, it's good to study psychology. It's just like any other subject. right? Now, psychology is not only about reading minds, but it's also about uh, helping people overcome emotional uh, failures, emotional challenges. Uh, psychology also has, you know, counseling in them. So there's varied topics in psychology, and it's good. Uh, you know, it's really good. And then there's also Christian psychology, uh, Christian-based uh, uh, psychologists who help. So there's nothing wrong. Uh, but we don't. We shouldn't go overboard by, you know. If you're a believer and you want to study psychology, take psychology, take the scriptures, put it together, and uh, you know uh, you can. It, it's really helpful for people. Right? You can give people good suggestions and all that. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll just take this last question. Okay, Diksha says, in different countries, if they give wine or alcohol in church and say it's good for health then can be say that they don't know the truth. OK, so there is two things here. Right? Uh, that's a very good question, Diksha. So number one is there's culture, and there's God's word, right? the truth of God's word. Now, in culture is something that, so for example, covering women cover their head, and especially in North India, women cover their head. We take out our footwear and go into church. This is what culture. Now, if you come to Bangalore, right, right, we don't cover our head. We don't take out our shoes. Right? Now, when we travel to North India for ministry, we, the women, we purposely we ask them to cover their hair. Now, we take out our footwear and get into church. Why? Because we are respecting the culture of the place. Right now, when culture is there, are certain cultures which can, which are there, which can defile us, which can take us away from God, which can bring an unholiness in us. Right now, for example, these, what I these two mentioned, it doesn't affect our relationship with God, but there are certain cultures which affect our relationship with God. So, for example, if if for 20 years, you've been an unbeliever, and you've got this habit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, reciting some, some of these old, uh, of the other faith, right? Uh, reciting or, or or doing certain things, and you feel that it's not right. It's it's again, it's taking you. You you need to change that. Now, yes, certain countries have a lot of wine. They have a lot of uh, alcohol. Right now, is alcohol good? The question is, it, it may be a culture, but is alcohol good? Answer is no, because what is what is superior? The Word of God, which says what? I am the body of Christ. Now, this culture 
of going to I go to weddings. I go to plenty of weddings, right? And sometimes they offer alcohol. I say no, I don't want it. It's it's a culture there, right? But what I I say is I say no. So it's not like they don't know the truth of God's word. It's just that they need to get a revelation in that area. Like they need to understand this. That hey, I am. You know, they may be good. They may be believers. Right? They they know Jesus. They love Jesus. But there are certain areas that they have to grow. Now, what we can do is help them to understand. Right. Uh, again, we cannot be condemning. Remember what the verse says. Therefore, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we cannot be in a place of condemning. But we can encourage, we can teach them. Sometimes they don't know, right? They don't know, oh, oh this is wrong. I didn't know it all this while. OK, I'll take steps to change. Um, yeah, so so one thing that we can do is remember that if they are from different countries, like, for example, when you go to, uh, I remember going to a couple of countries, and there, you know, it was, it was just so common, right? They don't have water. They just don't have water. They have alcohol with every food. And they're very good believers. Right? But it's a culture. It's, it's how they've set their mindset is that way. But then I know of some of them who have come out of it. Now they drink water or some juice with food. So I think the more we speak to them, the more we, of course, I know that you're talking about people from different countries. But we cannot say that they don't know the truth. Just because somebody is failing in one area doesn't mean they know don't know the truth of God at all. Now we may not know many things, we, or we may not know one or two things. Doesn't mean we don't know the truth. Meaning, we know the truth of God's word. We know that we should not get angry, but sometimes we do get angry. We know that we shouldn't walk in pride. Sometimes we walk in pride. So it doesn't mean we don't know the truth. We know it. It's just that we have made that mistake. So. So we learn from all of this. Uh, and yeah. So we'll stop here. Uh, I don't have taken extra time, but uh, it's good to get, have these questions. If you have more questions, uh, well, you know, we can take it up maybe next class on, on Wednesday. We can answer these questions. So if you have questions regarding all of this, you can just write it down and ask next week. Right? right. Thank you so much for being in this class. Uh, and we'll catch up next week. But we can. God bless.